welcome you to This Week at Calvary. We're going to do things a little differently over the next few weeks. We're going to take some time and discuss the following topic in defense of liberty. We live in a day where so many of our liberties have been taken away, and if we're not careful, many more will follow. We're going to be interviewing folks and preaching on the subject of in defense of liberty. Be sure to have your Bible ready. Be ready to take some notes and be a part of This Week at Calvary, brought to you by the Calvary Baptist Church in Portsmouth, Ohio, and on the web at callsofcalvary.com. Well, we welcome you to this interview with Calvary, and I'm grateful to have as my guest a person with a very unique ministry. This is attorney Jim Robideau, and he works with Lighthouse Legal Ministry out of Ashtabula, Ohio. They've been a great friend to our church, but they're on the front lines of this idea of religious liberty. They're helping churches. They're helping Baptist churches do the work that God's given them to do, and I'm glad to have him on as we begin this series on defense of liberty. So, Attorney Robido, good to have you with us. Pretty sure it's good to be here. Now, tell us a little bit, how long have you been with Lighthouse, and, and just kind of a little introduction here before we get rolling. Sure. Uh, pretty sure I've been with Lighthouse Legal Ministries now for the last seven years. I came over here at the time. Uh, Attorney Terry Hamilton, who was our founding director, uh, established the ministry with our pastor uh, here at Lighthouse Baptist Church back in 1995. And I came on board about seven years ago, and uh, tr I was a practicing attorney in Illinois for nearly 20 years before I came over, and uh, was able to do that and uh, become admitted to the Ohio Bar. And now I am the director. Terry stepped down last year, and I'm now the uh, director of White House Legal Ministries. Now, we're talking about this specific vein of in defense of liberty. You know, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free. What does it mean to you as a Christian, as an attorney, you're working in court system and in a local church setting and all those things, when we talk about this term, liberty, and standing fast in liberty? Well, preacher, I have a couple of different thoughts that come to my mind. You know, as a, as a Christian, you know, when you read the, the scriptures, you know, God's people need to be free to follow the dictation of the conscience to serve uh, God as they see uh, fit. And, of course, the, one of the clearest examples is when Moses went to the Pharaoh, and he made a statement. He said, let my people go, but he did not end there. The statement, the complete statement was, let my people go that they may serve me. Amen. And uh, for the Christian, liberty and serving God go hand in hand. And, of course, that's why... You know, uh, we look at more than just individual liberty. We look at religious liberty. But when I think about uh, individual liberty, there are many subjects that are taught in schools. Many of our Christians, uh, you know, if they haven't read up on these things, there's a battle of philosophy between the thing called natural law and positivism. And I don't want to uh, get off track on that too much, except to say that our liberty comes from our from God. It comes from our maker. Amen it does not come from a written document that's issued by government leaders. And that's really uh, the big thing. When we look at individual liberty and liberty, we look at it from a Christian perspective. It is to serve God. But then also uh, individuals have liberty because of, of who they are, because they are a God or made in the image of God. Uh, we have liberty. We, we hold that belief. Now, Liberty is not chaos. It's not just everybody gets to do what they want to do. You couch that in the context of, I have liberty to serve God. And that's what we just read in Galatians. It's wherewith Christ hath made us free. Mm -hmm. What are reasonable restraints on the liberty that God has given us? Well, I think the first thing is, you know, we don't even have to, to think about it. I mean, preacher, I spent 32 years in the Army, and we had a saying about don't reinvent the wheel. I mean, you talk about reasonable restraints. The first thing is the law that God gave his people back there. We, you know, they refer to it as the Decalogue, but the Ten Commandments. You know, the reasonable things are, you know, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt, you know, not uh, steal. You know, I've got to make sure I get the – thou shalt not – uh, do these different things here, those are reasonable restrictions uh, on the freedom because we understand that God did not want us to do that in the first place. So really, government law for millennium 
and all across cultures have been founded uh, and based on these principles, a simple ten laws. Now, again, we're not going to have laws about thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother, uh, not not in modern day America. But the thing is, the the laws that correspond with our criminal laws and that violence against another, uh, we don't want to be doing that. We want to go ahead and have uh, those types of restrictions are reasonable. And so I would go right back to the scriptures again uh, when Moses. Uh, led the children out of uh, Israel out of Egypt. We have that example. Uh, there are other examples in the scriptures where, you know, uh, our Lord had to deal with certain things and he acknowledged them on there. But I think that those are uh, the ones that, um, you know, the ones that we have listed in the scriptures, the simple ones uh, in the book of Exodus. I think that that is the place to start. Now, I mentioned the word anarchy earlier. We live in a very clearly tumultuous time and there is so much being done in the name of I get to do whatever I want to do and let my opinion be declared what role should liberty have in being the response to the anarchy that we see so I mean how can a person who says I believe in liberty be the actual response to that doesn't mean you get to do whatever you want to do. There are some restraints. Well, preacher, you know, if you read the scriptures, you know, it's, it's very interesting because uh, people who study eschatological subjects, they study this period of time called the millennial reign, and uh, we have uh, a belief that Jesus Christ will come and he will rule and reign for 1,000 years. And it says his his reign is characterized as a he'll have a rule of the rod of iron and so we understand there's going to be uh, an outward compulsion you know at that time but at this time you know uh as we live christians uh and that is people who know christ who uh who have put their faith and trust in him they have a holy ghost who lives within them and the best type of uh answer to anarchy is the holy ghost uh the Spirit of God that lives within Christians that restrains them and uh, has them living the way that he would. And you can read all types of things. The Apostle Paul put, you know, had, had written a passage where he said, I believe it was the Apostle Paul, if it is at all possible to live peaceably one with another. And so we're supposed to exercise that self-restraint. The Spirit of God allows us to be able to live that way. And that is the best answer to, you know, the anarchy uh, the scripture is clear. The New Testament is clear. God is not the author of confusion. He says, let everything be done decently and in order. And people who are acting out uh, on their, um, their, their gut instincts and, and, and just because they feel like doing it, there used to be an expression that said, if it feels good, do it. Right. Uh, and, of course, that's a very you know, anarchistic uh, philosophy. But people who are Christians, who are led by uh, the Spirit of God, do not follow that, and they have a restraint there. Now, now, granted, we live in a society where many people are not Christians, but Christians of all people ought to, you know, live a restrained type of life. Ought to follow the dictates of uh, the Spirit of God in their lives. Well, that's very good. We, you know, we think about the role that we have as influencing salt and light on others. You know, we we ought to be the example. Come back with me, if you would, as we kind of bring this first segment to a close. And when we talk about the role of a Christian in this world, um, we have two things. Number one, it's to be that example. But then the second is to stand up for what is right. And both of those are in the realm of individual soul liberty. What is the responsibility of the believer to stand up for what is right and keeping that in in a balance with being an example of not being violent or angry or mean or unkind? What's the balance there, you think? Well, preacher, you know, I, th I think that the, the balance on that is, you know, uh, look at your number one uh, individual uh, responsibility. And yes, you know, uh, but I spent the years in the Army. Leadership by example was always an ethic that we operated by. But uh, when it comes to taking a stand, and I, and I talk with this with a lot of uh, men who have young families. I have sons. 
who have young families in that. And, and that is uh, they have a responsibility to take care of their wife and their children and to get out there and work. And I know I've discussed with many people about, you know, the work ethic and, and that, but get out there and, and provide for their family. In fact, the Apostle Paul said if a person doesn't provide for their family, he doesn't say they're an infidel. He says they're worse than an infidel. But, uh, you know, I would say that people need to take care of those responsibilities. First, their personal relationship with God. You know, they need to, to keep their nose in the Bible. They need to have a relationship with God through prayer. They need to take uh, take those things and make sure that those things are in order. And then they can go ahead and look at things like taking a stand. And I, I see a lot of people that, that want to go ahead and take a stand, but then they don't have these other things that are more fundamental and, and maybe even more important again. Uh uh, in order, but when it comes to taking a stand, that is something that Christians can do. But it's it's not something it's it's not the first thing that they're told to do. You know, the first command the Bible says after you get saved is to get baptized. Right. You know, uh, to get uh, to get plugged in to learn, uh, educate themselves about the things of God. Then you can take that stand. But like I mentioned, if somebody is confused about when to take the stand, where to take the stand, make sure that you. Are being, you know, you have that relationship with God. You understand what the Scripture is saying. That you're being instructed. That you're, that you're seeking counsel. That you're learning. Uh, that you're uh, improving yourself, so to speak, and that you're growing as a Christian. And then, you know, you'll go ahead and see where to take that stand. It'll help you to to, to take a better stand and to know where to draw the line. Very good. I I like that. One leads into the other. First. Before we can take a stand, we have to have our own selves right with the Lord. That's a very good point. We're coming into our second segment here in just a few moments, and we'll be back. And we're going to talk more about some of the work that Lighthouse is doing in helping churches and kind of on that front line of some of the battles that uh, churches are facing on this matter of individual soul liberty. We'll be back in just a few moments.
James 5.16 Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5.16 Very good. We're back for the next part of our interview with Attorney Jim Robido from Lighthouse Legal Ministry. We talked a little bit in the first segment about liberty and our personal responsibility, but I'd like to go to some issues of the day that they are working with at Lighthouse Legal as it pertains to churches, decisions, liberties, especially during maybe this this pandemic time and and some of the restrictions that have been put on. Uh, Brother, tell us, if you would, what are some of the primary liberty battlefronts that you are dealing with right now in your legal ministry? Well, preacher, uh, what we're dealing with, we're focused, obviously, on the local church, uh, you know, we don't get involved with school prayer issues or anything like that. I mean, we'll get calls about the rights of students in public schools quite frequently. But, uh, but preacher, our ministry, as you understand, is focused on the local church. You know, we are unique because we're a ministry of a local right. independent Baptist church. And, you know, we are supported only by independent Baptist uh, churches, and we represent only independent Baptist churches and ministries and that. So that's our focus, not so much on the individual liberty, you know, workplace issues and, and issues like that, which are important issues. And we'll steer people toward uh, other Christians that can help them with that. But our focus is on the local church. And so we, we deal with religious liberty issues and many issues that uh, affect the local church. Uh, because of my background, preacher, I, I came out of the banking industry as a as a young man and and did some accounting and have an economics and finance background, and that uh, I wound up uh, working with churches a lot on financial and tax issues. And in fact, I would say the the, the primary battleground has historically been uh, taxes and revenue. Of course, that tax revenue is the lifeblood of government, right. and so uh, we help churches with property tax issues. We help churches with sales tax exemption issues. We help churches with uh, pastoral social security uh, issues. We help churches with uh, payroll tax issues for their employees. Uh, a lot. We do a lot of uh, interposition, I would say, going be, being a go between between churches and the IRS and the local departments of revenue and the local property tax collectors. Uh, that's probably the biggest one, but we do focus on religious liberty and free speech, uh, uh, free uh, exercise, I should say, issues. And when it comes to our churches, we still get a surprising number of calls about door knocking, about the bus ministries, about uh, things like that. Now, of course, you mentioned uh, absolutely the last six or eight months, Preacher, who would have thought that we would be uh, debating in America, you know, how long can the government close churches? which is a First Amendment fundamental right, the right to exercise freely, you know, your religion. And uh, we've been dealing with a lot of that, the COVA or coronavirus, COVID-19 issues. And, of course, early on that started with stay-at-home orders and shut state uh, governor, government-mandated shutdowns and that were churches uh, uh, to be considered to be essential uh, services in that. Uh, and then that's now morphed into mask issues, and not just mask issues in general, which is an individual liberty uh, issue, but now uh, mask mandates on schools and those that apply to our Christian, do it, apply to our church schools here in Ohio. So those are the issues that have been uh, keeping our phones ringing off the the hook uh, lately. But uh, but normally it is free exercise issues, again, churches and taxes, churches and local officials, zoning matters have always been a big uh, issue uh, with us where we're advising churches and helping churches. And so it's those types of issues that deal with our churches and integral church uh, ministries that have been taking up the bulk of our uh, efforts here at LLM. Well, then, as you come back to this essential First Amendment principle, um, you know, no law against the free exercise of religion. Why is, in your opinion, church and religion giving a special position in our federal documents? You know, somebody asked me about uh, if, if our 
government can control a church. I said, man, we've got our own amendment. It's right there in the beginning, you know. <laughs> we've got it clear. Um, why is that such a bedrock principle in our country? Well, you know, uh, Preacher, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I think the world is looking for us to explain things. And I hear, I hear well-meaning people argue, well, churches provide services. Yeah. You know, they, they, they relieve the social, you know, safety net. Uh, but really, that justification is not necessary. Uh, Amen. It, our, our churches and our, our free exercise religion has a premier position in our United States Constitution. The very First Amendment uh, started off or starts off: Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's in there before even free speech, before all these other uh, different rights that you have uh, in the Bill of Rights. And so uh, there are many good reasons that it's there, but just as a fundamental principle of law, it is, you know, explicit. It is written specifically. It is written clearly in our federal constitution, which is, you know, this constitution that uh, the states consented to, agreed to when they joined the union, and that says that that uh, all laws made pursuant to this constitution and the constitution and treaties. Uh, are to be considered the supreme law of the land. They have a supremacy clause in the United States Constitution. And so uh, our Constitution is the supreme document for law uh, in the United States, and uh, we have a premier position in there. Now, that being said, uh, I think it's clear that the founders, the framers, as people like to call them, the people who wrote the United States Constitution, uh, and, and when they went ahead, you, you understand that the Bill of Rights was adopted as a condition for uh, the acceptance of the Constitution by many of the states. And so the people who wrote the Bill of Rights understood the importance of our religious liberty. And so it was included as uh, up there in the Bill of Rights. And so it has been adopted. It's very difficult for people who, you know, uh, hate Christianity and who hate religion, hate God, uh, to get around that. But the truth of the matter is it was put in that position and because it's part of the Constitution, uh, it is not up to, you know, a 50% plus one Democratic vote. Uh, those rights are guaranteed uh, constitutionally. Well, then, as, as we kind of bring all this to a head, if we were to challenge people about first, like we said earlier, being an example of, of what a, a Christian ought to be or what a servant of God ought to be or even an American ought to be, um, and then we move to standing up. How would you, as we bring all this to a close, how would you challenge our listeners today to first be the person that they must be and then in turn stand up in the times in which we live for the liberties that God has given his people? Well, preacher, I would challenge them to you know, be the best Christian that they can be. And, you know, what America needs, what uh, Ohio needs, are good Christians. You know, we don't, we don't need uh, extra population. I mean, we, uh, I'm all for people. Uh, I'm all for growing families and our young people getting to be voting age and participating. And I'm all for, you know, immigration. My grandfather uh, was a Swedish immigrant, came over here uh, to America. But what America needs more than anything else is good Christians. And the way you become a good Christian is obviously... You know, you put your trust in Christ and, and get a home in heaven and then join up with a good uh, local independent Baptist church or a good local church if there's not an independent Baptist church in your area. And so, uh, and then live for God, be the best Christian. But then we talk about standing up and the, the challenge, you know, to stand up. Uh, I would say this, that, uh, uh, you know, the Bible says to pray for our leaders. You know, we, we owe them a few different uh, things that we need to pray for people who are in authority. Uh, I cut up a little bit about because the scriptures, Jesus said, uh, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. We need to, uh, you know, just need to pray for people. We need to pay a little bit. You know, I, boy, that hurts to say that. Hmm. But Jesus did say if it's, if it's Caesar's, he was so smart there taking that coin with Caesar's image on it. And he said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. So, you know, uh, we don't believe in tax, uh, evasion or anything like that. We believe in minimizing taxes and work with churches on and pastors on. But uh, you need to pray for these people. You need to pay for them. Uh, pay uh, your, your portion in there. But then you need to participate, I tell people. 
And this is the thing, uh, preacher. I appreciate you engaging many of the local officials. You know, President Trump certainly needs our prayer. But how many people are going to be able to have that relationship with President Trump? And yet you can reach out to local officials, local legislators, local mayors, and have a relationship with them and, and participate. Maybe someone within the sound of this radio program you know, uh, would seek wise counsel and with wise counsel perhaps run for office, you know, participate in the program. But uh, but even if you don't run as an individual participant, you know, engage with the locals. And, you know, one of the big issues, the big question marks that we're seeing, Preacher, is, uh, you know, what can government do in an emergency? And I think that the real secret in this COVID crisis is that the legislature has given governors tremendous power. And I think that if some of our people were to engage with the local legislators, that's legislators, that's probably the big thing that needs to be looked at is, these powers need to be reviewed, and they need to be, uh, in many cases, restrained, especially where the governors are using them to restrict religious liberty. So I would encourage, I would challenge people, you know, pray for these leaders, you know, be a good citizen, um, but then also, you know, uh, get involved. And on these issues, the issues of our time, the coronavirus issues, you know, uh, work with your local legislators, because what we're seeing is that many governors are overstepping uh constitutional bounds well very good good instruction and i thank you very much for the interview i'm grateful to have attorney jim robideau as our guest today and and if you have questions about lighthouse legal ministry i'm sure you can find them on the internet and and they can be a help and encouragement they provide great resources for churches and they've been a help to this one as well so uh, brother it's been a pleasure to have you with us thank you for being a part of it's been a joy here also thank you very much god bless you